So thank you everyone for joining us. We're super excited uh, to be hosting Catherine Hayhoe today. I'm Winona Bateman with Families for a Livable Climate. Um, and I am so thrilled to be here with Catherine Hayhoe and also our moderator, doc Dr. Kathy Whitlock. Um, and we are so appreciative of the support of our co-sponsors at Moms Clean Air Force Montana and um, Montana Mountain Mamas. We really appreciate their support um, in making this event happen. Um, before I introduce our moderator, I want to do a land acknowledgement. Um, so today, many of us are joining this conversation from what is now commonly known as Montana. This land is the original homeland of the Assiniboine, Absoluca or Crow, Blackfeet, Chippewa, Cree, Gros Vent, Kootenay, Little Shell Chippewa, Northern Cheyenne, Pend Oreille, Bitterroot Salish, Sioux, and other tribes that interacted with these lands. Since time immemorial, the people of these nations held a reciprocal relationship with the land and all the life that it supported. This land was forcibly stolen through Western colonization initiating a deterioration of the healthy interaction between people and the land. Going forward, may we honor the land, waters, and all beings that make this place their home by recognizing the relations between all life and caring for our shared future with mutual respect and equitable solutions. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce my co-moderator, the accomplished and insightful Dr. Kathy Whitlock, Dr. Whitlock is nationally and internationally recognized for her research and leadership activities in the field of past climate and environmental change. Kathy co-authored the 2017 Montana Climate Assessment, the 2020 Montana Climate Solutions Plan, and the 2021 Climate Change and Human Health in Montana. Currently, she is working on a Greater Yellowstone Climate Assessment to be released in June. In 2018, Kathy became the first person from a Montana university to be elected to the National Academy of Sciences. Thank you, Kathy, for joining us. I'm gonna let you take over. Thanks so much, Winona. Gosh, I'm very excited to be part of this event, especially since I've long been an admirer of Catherine's work and her advocacy. Um, I thought I'd start off by just talking a little bit about what climate change means for us in Montana. From the Montana Climate Assessment, we know that most of our issues are caused by rising temperatures. Montana has gotten two to three degrees warmer since 1950. And I guess the good news is that because we've gotten warmer, our growing season is now 12 days longer than it was in 1950. But if we continue at our present rate of greenhouse gas emissions, temperatures in Montana could be as much as 10 degrees Fahrenheit higher by the end of the century than they are now. And that's gonna be a big deal. Rising temperatures are shrinking our high elevation water supplies because rain is replacing snow and they're leading to earlier snow melt, faster stream runoff and summer water shortages. When you think about it, there's a lot of collateral damage that comes from climate change in this region. First, we're already witnessing um, ecological change as animals and plants try to keep pace with the warming. Grizzly bears are on the move, wolverines and white bark pine populations are declining, frogs and toads are having a hard time, and migratory birds may be arriving before their food sources are available. Second, we're learning to live with more wildfires. With less snowfall and warmer summers, Forests are becoming even drier than they have been, and they're more fire prone each year. The Yellowstone fires of 1988 pale in comparison to some of the fires that we've seen in the West in recent years. We also are facing economic uncertainties in our tourism and recreation sectors and in agriculture. Think about it, declining snowpack threatens Montana's ski industry and less reliable water supplies pose challenges for farmers, ranchers, and, and towns. And then we're seeing health consequences from climate change, more smoke, more days of extreme heat, more climate surprises that stress us mentally and physically. And the impact of climate change is felt most by the old and the very young, 
as well as vulnerable populations far from services. So given this backdrop for Montana, it's great that we can turn to our speaker and get her insights. So let me introduce her. Dr. Catherine Hayhoe is an atmospheric scientist whose research focuses on understanding climate change and what it means for people and the places where we live. Recently, she became the chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy. And she's also a Horn Distinguished Professor and Endowed Professor of Public Policy and Public Law at Texas Tech University. Her book, Saving Us, A Climate Scientist's Case for Hope and Healing in a Divided World will be released this September. And she also hosts the PBS digital series, Global Weirding, which is currently in its fifth season. Catherine was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People. She's been the United Nations Champion of the Environment and the World Evangelical Alliance Climate Ambassador. So welcome, Catherine. We're so glad to have you here. Thank you so much. It is great to be with you here today. It is such a pleasure. And you have done such a great case already for laying out how and why climate change matters to everyone who lives in Montana. So today I'm going to be speaking specifically about the most important thing that each one of us can do about climate change. And to do that, I'm going to share my screen with you. Here we go. And begin. When we talk about individual things that we can do, to help with climate change or to help with the environment in general, we often hear people saying things like change your light bulbs and I have changed my light bulbs. We say uh, recycle, get smart thermostats. I have done all of these things. We also say, well, how about considering a, a plug-in or electric car? I do that. I have solar panels. I reduce my food waste. We eat more plants. We're careful about what meat we eat. We offset what we can't reduce. We look at where our money is invested. I do all of these things. And a lot of other people are willing to engage with these types of things. So the Yale Program on Climate Communication last year surveyed people around the US and they asked them a bunch of questions. And they found, for example, that a third of us have rewarded companies for doing the right thing when it comes to climate change and carbon emissions. 27% uh, of us have punished companies by taking steps to not use their products. Um, for example, Chase, is the number one bank that's provided the largest amount of funding to uh, fossil fuel extraction in the fossil fuel industry since uh, 2016, over the last five years. So I actually um, canceled my Chase card this year. Um, only 4% of Americans say they're either, either vegan or vegetarian, but 94% of us are willing to eat more fruits and vegetables and 62% of us are, more, are very willing. So there's a lot of positive momentum behind specific actions that individuals can take. And for that reason, a lot of our communication often focuses and a lot of our engagement often focuses on those specific tangible steps. Here's the question though. The trillion dollar question, really actually the quadrillion dollar question, because that's how much climate change will cost us by the end of the century if we don't fix it. The quadrillion dollar question is, if all of us are good citizens and do all of these good things on the 10 commandments of green living, will this fix climate change? And the answer I have for you is very clear. The answer is no. No, it will not fix climate change. All the recycling, the light bulbs, the plant-based diets, the electric cars in the world are not enough to fix climate change. Let me actually do the math with you to prove it because some of you may not believe me, but I'm a scientist, so I always calculate things. And you may have said, I was told there would be no math. Don't worry, I'll do the calculations and it will only involve multiplication, nothing else. There's no imaginary numbers here. Let's start with this figure here first. We know that when it comes to concern about climate change, 26% of people in the US and, tw and 20 are already alarmed and 29% are already concerned. So we've got 55% of people in the United States who are already either alarmed or concerned about climate change. Let's assume that on average, all of the people who are either alarmed or concerned about climate change are able and willing 
to cut their carbon footprint by 50%. Now I'm saying 50% because some might be able to do more, some might be able to do 80% or 90%, some might be able to do much less because they might not be able to make the changes because of their income, because of the resources available to them. They might not be able to do these things and some might not be willing, they might be concerned but they not, might, might not be willing. So let's assume optimistically that 50% of the alarmed or concerned people in the United States could cut their carbon emissions 50% on average, okay? So that's the start of the math. Individual choices, however, only control at most about 40% of US emissions. And that's a bit optimistic. It's actually a bit less than 40%. So we've got 55% of people who are cut their carbon em emissions in half, but their choices only determine about 40% at most of US emissions. The rest are determined by industry, by the military. Did you know that the US military is the number one consumer of carbon emissions of any organization in the world? So there's a lot of bigger organizations and industry that produce a lot of emissions that our individual choices can't affect directly. So let's do the math here. What is 50% of the carbon emissions of 55% of the people in the United States if those emissions add up to 40% of national emissions? That's 11%. 11% if all the people who are alarmed and concerned put a really hefty effort into cutting their carbon emissions, 11%. That's why this is not enough. Not only that, but I'm gonna tell you something that I only learned recently that absolutely shocked me. It should not have surprised me, but it shocked me. And it is this, you may have heard of something called the ecological Footprint. And the ecological footprint is something that was developed by William Reese and Matthias Wagernagel. They are um, uh, sustainability experts. Um, Reese is Canadian and Wagernagel is Swiss. And as sustainability experts, they developed this really good metric that basically talks about how much uh, food, how much water, how much land, how much resources, and how much carbon an individual person uses. And if everybody lived like them, how many planets would we need to support 8 billion people? So you can see that in the US, the average person consumes so many resources. And again, this is talking about everything. So I'm about land, food, materials, uh, water, everything. In the US, we would need five planets. We are so wasteful. We waste over 50% of the energy we produce and burn. We waste over 40% of the food we produce. We waste so much of what we have that we would need five planets if everybody lived as wastefully as we did. Australia's at four, Germany's at three, the UK is at 2.9. Down there in India, we've got 0.7. The world in general is at 1.7. Okay. So this is a sustainability concept. It's the idea of, are we living within the boundaries of our planet? And the answer to this is no. We're not living within the boundaries of our planet, which means we are unsustainably depleting our resources. And that means that we are going to end up in trouble. It's like we're running down our bank account too fast and we're gonna start running a negative balance in our bank account because we're not using our money or our resources sustainably. This is a very valid concept and it's one that's incredibly useful I find to use with, um, with kids, for example. They get it, how many planets, that's not fair. Okay, here's the shocking part. Only one part of this is the individual carbon footprint. And again, this was developed specifically to look at countries' responsibility, not individual people. It's helpful to do this exercise for yourself, and I've done it myself. I'm sitting actually um, around four, just under four for my personal life. But this was developed to look at countries' responsibility. So three years after the ecological footprint was developed, three years afterwards, the carbon part of it was pulled out and it was applied to individuals. By who? Not by sustainability experts, by British Petroleum, which is one of the 70 companies that has produced two thirds of the heat trapping gas emissions since the beginning of the industrial era. Let me say that again. On the left-hand side is an analysis of the companies, look at the cumulative impact there, the companies that have produced the most carbon emissions since the dawn of the industrial era. 
70 companies have produced two thirds of the emissions, two thirds from 70 companies. And at the top, we have Saudi Aramco, Chevron, ExxonMobil, and British Petroleum. So three years after the concept of the ecological footprint was developed, BP took out the carbon part, they applied it to individual people rather than countries, and they developed the and popularized the first online personal carbon footprint calculator. Why might they do that? Well, there's a little clue here that came from uh, that comes from research that people have done. I don't know if you've read the book or seen the movie Merchants of Doubt. If you haven't, I highly recommend it. Winona, maybe you could put a link in the chat there for people because it's a really great documentary to watch, kind of horrifying. And there's projects like Exxon New that talk about how these companies like Exxon and Chevron and British Petroleum and others basically decide to invest in muddying the waters on the science and also invest on making every individual person feel guilty about their carbon emissions so that we would be very focused on our recycling and, and our, our thermostats and our diet and our solar panels and our electric cars and our travel footprint so that we would be focused on this so that what? So that they could go their merry way being the richest companies in the world. And in fact, as recently as just two years ago, um, the CEO of Shell was talking to a group of people and he said, I have three daughters. They're all quite fashion conscious. I like to point out to them that having new clothes four times a year creates a significant ecological footprint. And he went on to say those people who eat strawberries in the winter, those people are really responsible for a big part of the problem. Now, don't get me wrong. The fashion industry has a very big footprint in terms of its water use, its carbon production, and the whole issue of fair trade and not paying people living wages. There's a big problem there. And don't get me wrong, there's also a big problem with flying strawberries halfway around the world so you can eat them in winter, okay? But is that what's really responsible for the situation we have where we are producing 10 gigatons of carbon a year, more and more and more every year? The biggest part of that comes from what? from 70 corporations who burn coal, gas, and oil and encourage us to continue doing so. So when, a couple months ago, Shell asked on Twitter, what are you willing to do to help change, to help reduce emissions? Are you willing to offset your emissions, stop flying, buy an EV, or use renewable electricity? This is what I said. I said, I am willing to have a conversation with you about what we can all do once you have a plan, because you produce as much emissions today as the entire country of Canada. They didn't like that, they hid that tweet. But the whole point here is yes, every single one of us is responsible for sure. Every single one of us contributes to this problem. But if we only focus on ourselves, we aren't gonna be able to fix it. As my colleague, Michael Mann said, he's a climate scientist who you may have heard of. He's very well known. He wrote an essay for Time Magazine two years ago and I think he said something very acute. He said, it isn't about banning cars, it's about electrifying them. It isn't about banning burgers, it's about climate-friendly beef and plant-based uh, uh, meat products. A single scientist or even hundreds of scientists choosing to never fly again is not gonna change the system. The true solution is policy change. That is what must happen. But that then begs the question, how? And if you took a snapshot of the inside of my brain five or six years ago, it would have looked like this. At this point, my brain had kind of processed all the information I was just talking about. I was thinking, okay, that's fine, but I am not the head of the World Economic Forum. I am not the president or prime minister of a company. I am not the CEO of Microsoft or Google or Exxon or BP. So what am I and what are you supposed to do about this? So that's where I started thinking. And I started here. I went back to the Yale Program on Climate Communication the ones who did those six Americas, those groups that people fall into. And I looked at a series of very interesting maps that had just come out then about five years ago. And I'm showing you the updated version here. Five years ago, they had just done a few of these maps and I started looking at them very carefully because I found that they were very interesting. You can find them yourself. And in fact, uh, maybe Winona, you could just Google Yale Climate Opinion Maps 2020. They'll pop right up and she can put the link in the chat. You can zoom in on each individual county in Montana and you can even zoom in on congressional districts to get people's opinions. Anywhere that's more than 50% is orange or yellow and anywhere that's less than 50% is blue. So 
They ask people, is global warming happening? It turns out most people say, yes, it's happening. Then they say, do you think it will harm plants and animals? Most people say, yes, it will harm plants and animals. Do you think it will harm future generations? This might look like the same map, but it isn't. It's the same number of people. So most people in the US say it's real, it will harm future generations, it will harm plants and animals. Will it harm people in developing countries? Well, now we're talking about humans today, right? Rather than plants and animals or people in the distant future. So it's starting to get a bit lighter yellow. You even see a little bit of blue, but it's still mostly orange. And then they said, will it harm people in the United States? We're down to 61% now from 72 or 73. And then they asked this question, and this is where the light bulb went off to me. Do you think it will harm you? Look at this, it's blue. It is blue almost everywhere. Why? Because when we talk about climate change, what do we talk about? We talk about, uh, or we actually, we don't talk about it. We talk, we talk about the future or plants and animals or polar bears or people who live far away or we don't talk about it. And when I got to this map, this was the really shocking one. 35% of people talk about it occasionally, which means what? 65% of people don't talk about it even occasionally. And if you don't talk about something, why would you care? And if you don't care, why would you ever want to do anything to fix it? So that is where my TED Talk came from. When they asked me to do a TED Talk, I said, I want to do a TED Talk on the single most important thing that people can do to help fix climate change. And there's a link in the chat there if you want to save it for later, because this is not my TED Talk. I'm telling you behind the curtain why I decided to do the TED Talk. It's because I realized that we weren't talking about climate change. So I said, I want to do a TED Talk on the most important thing we could do about climate change. And they said, we already have TED Talks on electric vehicles and plant-based diets and light bulbs and efficiency. I said, no. I said, obviously, all of those things are important. But what we're not doing yet is we're not talking about any of these things. And why would we think they are important if we never talk about them? So often when we say talk about climate change, people say, oh, we just need to explain the science more clearly. And that's what I used to do too. In fact, of course, I still talk about science. I am a scientist. So we tell people, oh, we just need more science. We can tell people, oops, whoa, something funny just happened there. There we go. We can tell people that global temperature is increasing and it is. We can tell people that glaciers are melting and that Arctic sea ice is getting thinner and retreating. We can tell them that the growing season's getting longer and that pests and diseases like deer ticks and Lyme disease are spreading poleward and all of this is happening. We can tell them that uh, when you look at scientific studies, we've got 2.6 million scientific studies on climate change. We can talk about how there's six intergovernmental panel on climate change assessments. If you piled up all the volumes, they'd reach all the way up to the ceiling. We can tell them how there's national climate assessments for the United States that I helped write 500 pages for the first volume that came out in 2017 and 1600 pages for the second volume that came out in 2018. We can tell people how 11,000 scientists have signed a letter saying that there's a climate emergency. We can tell people how we've known about the science since the 1800s, that these are literally the original scientists who connected the dots between digging up and burning coal at that time and then later natural gas and oil, heat trapping gases, building up in the atmosphere, wrapping an extra blanket around the planet, causing the planet to warm. These scientists knew that. That's how long we've known about the science. And yet, here we are. When you look at the most politicized issues in the entire United States, what's at the top? Climate change. So why haven't all these scientific facts convinced people. Why, when we say, do you think global warming is mostly caused by human activities, the map looks like this. And when you divide it out by political affiliation, it looks like this. Is more science going to fix this problem? It turns out the social science is very clear on this. The answer is no. More scientific facts are not the answer. We've been going about this for a hundred years the wrong way. 
What? Well, if we go to neuroscience, Tally Sherrod is a neuroscientist. She has a great TED talk and a really good book called The Influential Mind. She explains how our human brains are programmed to get a kick out of information. We like information, but if we give people new information that contradicts what they already believe, what does our brain do? It shuts off. She goes on and she says, a wealth of information available makes us more, more, more resistant to change because it's so easy. We can just Google and find somebody who disagrees with us. I tell somebody, you really should get vaccinated for COVID. And they're like, oh, I saw a YouTube video from somebody who says they're a, a medical doctor who says you don't have to, or that it's a bad thing. We can find whatever we want to support our pre-existing opinion. And it, it gets worse. She says, as we're exposed to contradictory information and opinions, polarization expands with time as people receive more and more information. <sighs> Horrifying. Dan Cahan is a social scientist at Yale University. And he's actually found that the more scientifically literate we are, we're more polarized about climate change. The more scientifically literate we are, it doesn't mean that we're more worried, we're more polarized. And he even did an experiment on this. He said, and I'm sorry, I'm missing the question here at the top. The question is, you know, is the planet warming due to burning fossil fuels? And he then did a little test where he tested the people's ability to understand data and statistics and scientific results. And he ranked people by their ability to do this. It's just one measure of something he called ordinary science intelligence. And he found that in general, the higher people's ordinary science intelligence, the more likely they were to say yes, but it's a very weak correlation. I mean, we go from at the very bottom 35% to the very top 60%. But then he divided this into two groups based on what? Political affiliation. And here's what he found. He found that the smarter we are, the better we are at identifying information that shows why we're right and everybody else is wrong. To put it another way, the smarter we are, the better we are at out arguing the devil. And if our political identity demands that we reject something, we will be very good at proving to ourselves and others why it can't be true. So that's why when climate changes and we get worried, our tendency to dump scary facts on people backfires. What the social science says is it actually causes people to reject it even more. Inaction results. As Tally Sherratt says, fear and anxiety actually cause us to withdraw, to freeze, to give up rather than taking action. So when I say talk about climate change and you say, well, I'm not a scientist, but I could maybe rustle up some facts about how fast Antarctica is melting and the polar bears are starving. It turns out that actually is gonna be worse, worse, not better. So how do we break this vicious cycle? Don't worry, we've hit rock bottom and we're going up from here. How do we break this vicious cycle? How can we as individuals help? If we as individuals do everything we can to cut our personal carbon footprint, that's not enough. If we as individuals do everything we can to tell everybody how bad it is and that's not enough, in fact, it might make things worse. How do we break the vicious cycle? What's the answer? The answer is by sharing the right kind of information. The real problems we have are that we don't think it matters to us and we don't think there's anything positive we can do to fix it. Those are the real problems. So flip this around. What should we be talking about? We should be talking about why it matters to us, which Kathy did a great job of when she introduced this webinar, very clearly how it matters to Montana. We've got reduced snowpack, shorter ski season, invasive species and pests coming in. Yes, a longer growing season, but that also shifts the type of plants that can be grown, the types of crops that can be grown. We're also seeing heat waves, heavy rainfall events in the summer. Why does it matter to us in Montana and what we can do to fix it? Remember, people agree it's happening, but they don't think it matters to them personally. This is something called psychological distance, the idea that it's only about polar bears or it's about people who live far away, but not people who live close to us. So what's the solution to talk about why it matters to us and what we can do to fix it? Like what? Well, we can talk about how temperature is increasing and what's happening where we live. What is happening to heat waves where we live? 
And this is true if we live in Montana, Wyoming, California, uh, Arizona, Europe, Siberia. What's happening in the place where we live? What's happening as heavy precipitation gets more frequent? How is that affecting our flood risk and our crops and the safety of our homes? What's happening as wildfires are burning twice the area than they would have? Without a changing climate, there would have been 11 million acres burned naturally since the 1980s across the whole Western US, including Montana. But with climate change loading the dice against us, with climate change drying out our vegetation and our soil, we've seen double the area burned by wildfires because of a changing climate. We're seeing wildfires in California and what are they doing? Pushing people out of the state. They, don't, they can't afford or they don't wanna rebuild. We're seeing this happen in Alaska. We're seeing it happen in Canada. And if you can think back a year ago, I know it's hard to think before COVID, but just before COVID, what were the headlines about? The headlines were about Australia and their devastating bushfires too. Wherever we live, we can make the connection between climate change and what's happening here. I know Montana is not on the coast, but for people along the coast, they've got sunny day flooding happening. You've got cities like Miami raising the level of their streets by two feet. You've got all kinds of economic losses already harming people who own property along the coast. We know that oceans are warming and as oceans are warming, they're rising. We've got 700 million people who live in the low elevation coastal zone around the world. This could lead to 300 million refugees by 2100. As the oceans warm, they also lead to coral bleaching. They increase the risk of toxic algae. We eat fish from the ocean. We depend on the ocean for the base of our food chain. And we know that warmer oceans drive stronger hurricanes. I live in Texas where we get hurricanes and we know that as the ocean warms, they're intensifying faster, they're getting bigger, they're getting stronger, they're getting slower so they sit over us and they dump more rain on us. Wherever we live across the US, we're already vulnerable to billion dollar weather and climate disasters. Wherever we live, we already have droughts, floods, wildfires, heat waves and more. We already have two sixes on our dice, so to speak. But as the planet warms decade by decade, it's like climate change is sneaking in and replacing one number and then another number with a six and even a seven. And we're saying, hey, how could you have three 500 year flood events in three years? How could you have the five biggest wildfires on record in California in just one year since 1930s? How could this happen? Climate change is loading the dice against us. The question is not, did climate change cause this event? The question is, did climate change make this event worse? And in many cases, the answer that we can say is yes, climate change is demonstrably making this event worse. Whether it's the heat waves, whether it's the hurricanes, whether it's the wildfires, we can put numbers on how much worse climate change is making events that we are living through in the places where we are. It's not about the polar bears, it's not about the future. It is about right here. And this is a really important thing that we can talk about. Let's connect the dots to why we care. We don't only care about climate change because it affects the future, because it affects plants and animals. It affects our water. It affects our snowpack. It affects the food we eat. It affects the safety of our homes. It affects the economy, the amount that we pay for insurance, our jobs. It affects our health. Wildfire smoke, invasive species and diseases spreading northward, increased risk of air pollution, extreme heat in the summer. Climate change is already affecting our health in a myriad of ways. And there's that great new report that just came out. We don't know if you wanna put a link to that report in the chat on how climate change is affecting your health if you live in Montana. So I wanna make sure you're still paying attention here. Go back to Poly V if you don't mind. And I'm gonna ask you another question. You need to answer with one word now, please, one word. Why do you care about climate change? I care about climate change because it affects what? I don't wanna see the same answer here. I wanna see different answers because we're all different, right? We all care about climate change, but it affects different aspects of our lives. And if you need to use two words, put a dot between them because as you can see with the word, all the words get separated. So why do we care about climate change? It affects our health, it affects our rivers, it affects our air, it affects people, children, my nephews, all of us, humans. 
it affects our education, our mental health, our ecosystems. Climate change affects everything we care about. And that's why I'm absolutely convinced to care about climate change, we only have to be one thing. And that one thing is a human living on planet Earth. And as far as I know, we're all that. Right? So climate change is a threat multiplier. It takes all of the issues we already care about and it makes them worse. So it isn't a case of trying to move climate change up our priority list. I don't think climate change needs to be on any of our priority lists at all, not even mine, and I'm a climate scientist. Why not? Because the only reason I care about climate change is because it directly affects everything at the top of my list today. Climate change affects my child's future. Climate change affects our health. Climate change affects the poor and most vulnerable people more than anyone. Climate change affects where I live in Texas. Climate change affects my home of Canada. Climate change affects skiing. Climate change affects everything I care about. Rather than that polar bear being there on the iceberg, it's really us. We're the ones who are there on that metaphorical iceberg, us humans. We are all affected by climate change no matter who we are. So how do we have these conversations? Not by dumping scientific facts on people, but by starting with something we agree with people on, by connecting the dots to why climate change matters, to whatever it is we already care about, and then by talking about why we really can fix this. So let me model this to you, okay? Ready, what's step number one? Step number one is to bond over something that we agree on rather than something we disagree on. So I'm not gonna start with politics unless I share the person's politics and I'm Canadian, so I don't share too many people's politics. I'm not gonna start with something I disagree with. I'm gonna start with something I agree with somebody on, like what? Well, I love science. I also live in Texas. I love snow and ice. I'm a mom. I'm a Christian. So when I start conversations, I start conversations over things that I love. I have started conversations over knitting. I have started conversations over cooking. I have started conversations over not being a great gardener. Start a conversation based on who you are and what you love. Now I'm going to ask you another question. You know how this works. If you need two words, use a dot or a dash to join them. I care about climate change because I am. I am a what? Who are you that makes you care about climate change? And again, I don't want to see the same answers here because we're all different. My point here is we all care because of who we are. And who we are is already the perfect person to care. We could be a mom or a dad or have no kids. We could be a young person or an old person or a middle-aged person. We could be somebody who loves nature or somebody who doesn't really spend too much time in nature. We could be an outdoor explorer, a cyclist, a camper. We could be um, a compassionate person, um, a Christian, not a Christian. We could be a coffee lover, I love that. <laughs> a coffee lover, a grandma, an artist, a creature, a human. Whoever we are and whoever everyone else is, we're already the perfect person to care. And that's where we can start a conversation with somebody who's also a doctor or also a water drinker like that. Also somebody who fishes, also somebody who's a parent, also somebody who cycles or who's a hiker. That's where we can start those conversations. I was just talking to one of my colleagues recently who plays hockey. And he's a scientist, a very smart scientist who studies hurricanes. He does cutting edge research on hurricanes. And he realized that in his um, hockey community, that was where there was a lot of people who weren't too sure about climate change. So you know what he did? He decided to learn about how warming temperatures had been affecting ice rinks and the ability of people to play hockey outdoors in the place of where he lived in New Jersey. And that was the information he started to share with people. He wasn't talking about the science or about hurricanes. He was like, hey, did you know that this used to freeze every year and people used to play hockey here every year? But you know, remember, we haven't been able to play hockey here since 2016. Have you noticed that? So he was able to start conversations, not because he was a scientist, but because he loved hockey. So who are you that you can start conversations with people about? And then connect the dots connect the dots to why it matters. And you have so much information you can use in Montana to help connect the dots. We also have a great organization called Science Moms. I don't know, Winona, if you could just put the link in the chat there. It's, it's just sciencemoms.com where we help moms connect the dots. There's so many ways that you can connect the dots to why climate change matters, but don't neglect talking about solutions. 
I'm only going to give you a few appetizers here because we're almost going to your questions and just two, two more minutes will be on your questions, two or three more minutes. But we have to talk about solutions because people love good news. We need good news. And when it comes to climate change, there's a lot of good news out there already. Big corporations turning to clean energy. What's happening in my own state of Texas, where we've got the biggest army base in the US and they're powered 43% by clean energy. We've got the first carbon neutral airport in North America and Texas. We've got entire towns. Houston is the latest actually to join that are going carbon neutral. I like talking about what's happening in faith communities, whether Catholic or evangelical. I like talking about what's happening in really unexpected places like coal museums going solar. I like talking about how they're creating biofuel for airplanes and United Airlines has been running biofuel powered flights out of the LA airport for five years now. Most people don't know that. I love talking about what's happening around the world. What's happening in places where people don't have access to coal or gas or oil. What kids are doing to win science fairs. I love talking about how, you know, the country with the most number of green jobs is actually India. The country with the most clean energy is China. Project Drawdown, drawdown.org is the link to that. Project Drawdown has over a hundred positive solutions. If you don't know what to talk about, just go to Project Drawdown, read one of their pages and you'll have great stuff to talk about. Matthew Goldberg, you'll notice I like showing people pictures. Matthew Goldberg is a researcher who has studied talking about climate change and he's discovered it creates a true positive feedback loop. The more we talk about it, the more we know, the more we know, the more we care, the more we care, the more we talk about it. So triggering that positive loop really does make a difference. And who's the best person to do it? Not me, you. Friends and family, people who we know and who share our values are the most important people to do this. So when climate changes, we get worried, right? And what do we do? We don't dump scary data on people. What do we do? We share how it affects us and what we can all do to fix it. People feel empowered by that. And that's when real action results. To go back to the neuroscience, as Tally Sherratt says, the human brain is built to associate forward action with a reward, not avoiding harm. So we need to reframe our message so the information we produce induces what? Hope, not dread. Isn't that a beautiful word? What does talking affect? It affects who we see ourselves as, what people around us think. It affects something social scientists call our social norms, our idea of what's normal in the world. What is normal? Is it normal to drive a big giant gas guzzler or is it normal to drive a, um, an electric car? Is it normal that the richest companies in the world are fossil fuel companies or is it normal that we have different companies that are the richest companies? Our social norms are really important and they in turn determine whether we feel like if we act, if it'll make a difference. Because it turns out most of us feel like we won't make a difference and that's why we don't talk about it and that's why we don't act. So there's this whole series of dominoes. To fix climate change, we have to knock over all the dominoes. What's the first domino? The first domino is having a conversation. Having a conversation triggers all of the other dominoes to change what we think of ourselves, what people around us think, the social norms in our community, in our town, in our state, in our country, in the world, our sense of whether we can actually change anything and ultimately our ability and willingness to act. That is what all of this changes. I've written a new book based on a conversation I had with somebody who changed his entire town. His name is Glenn. And in my new book that's coming out, I actually talk specifically about social norms. So my book, I'm going to give you a tiny little preview for one minute of my book. You have to buy the book if you want to see the rest of it. But the book talks about social norms. It talks about how, for example, when um, a marketing professor asked people, why would you conserve energy? Most people said, oh, I do it because of environmental protection and benefit to society. That's why I conserve energy. And descriptive norms or social norms are basically what we think other people think is normal. So social norms are telling people, you know, most people bike or three people on your block have solar panels or your household uses 23% more energy than your neighbors. Those are social norms. People didn't think that that mattered. But what Robert did was he actually found that what people actually did. So what they thought is on the left, what they did is on the right. It turns out that the reason why people acted, the number one reason why people acted 
was because of what they thought other people thought. The number one reason people acted is because what they thought other people thought. How do you know what other people think when they talk about it? So talking is incredibly powerful. And I wanna leave you with a great hopeful quote, which is when we look at things that we didn't think could change like slavery, like smoking, like civil rights, like women having the vote, like even using plastic bottles. As a boy called Finley said to his dad, and his dad wrote this in his own book, he said, what climate change was for us, slavery was to people 200 years ago. It was a massive immovable object. Yet by being very small cogs in a very large machine, they were able to make a difference. So while it's hard for us to see how we can possibly make a dent, we just have to remember it has been done before. How has it been done before? by changing social norms, by having conversations, by being somebody like this wonderful man who saw my TED talk and decided he was gonna have conversations with people in his town of about 300,000 people. He had over 10,000 conversations in a year, 10,000 conversations. And as a result, his city council voted to, this is in the UK, devote 20 million pounds to sustainability efforts. They have a climate action plan and they are taking action, why? because the social norms of their town changed. Why? Because 10,000 people had a conversation about it. So that was just a tiny little preview of my brand new book that I'm really excited that's coming out. You can already order it today. We know to put a link in the chat if you're interested. But now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take your questions. Why is it that the first and most important step to tackling climate change is using our voices to advocate for change? I've told you why that is. And you know what? Every single one of us can do it. We all have a role to play. Thank you so much. This has been fantastic. And we are going to take your questions now via poll EV. Thanks. That was, that was really uh, inspiring. And there's so much good work going on now at the local level. Um, and it's inspiring to see what's being done at the federal level. But we have a kind of a trifecta in Montana right now where we have a very conservative Republican legislature and a conservative Republican governor, probably something you know about. And it just seems like it's, it feels like we really have this barricade in the middle between what's happening nationally and what's happening locally. And, and what are your thoughts about how we can connect and kind of go beyond this uh, state legislature and governor? Well, first of all, um, they do respond to citizens. And when I say using our voice to advocate for change, it is so important that that voice be used to advocate with our elected officials. Did you know that there are half a million elected officials in the US and only 0.1% of them are federal? There are so many who are not federal who are much more available to have conversations, but politicians are humans too. And what's the best way to begin a conversation with a human? Not by going in fighting angry or telling them what they did wrong or what you disagree with them on, but trying to figure out what are points of agreement. What's something that is important to them that's important to me too that's affected by climate change? What's a solution that would meet some of their goals that would also help prepare us for the impacts of a changing climate or be more efficient with our energy use or transition us to clean energy? What's a solution that might grow local jobs, that might bring down energy costs for people, that might help low-income communities, that might invest in farmers and ranchers? We have to work extra hard with elected officials because they're so busy and they see so many people to really figure out what are those points of connection in terms of things that they care about and solutions that matter. But it is possible, and I've seen so many examples of that happen through the very patient work of people like Citizens Climate Lobby, for example. So that is really important is to find those places of mutual agreement and to really focus as hard as we can on them as much as we really want to just go in and give people a piece of our mind. Thanks. Trust thanks. Me, I feel that too. And I'm sure everybody does, <laughs> <laughs> but that's not going to make a difference. Kathy, can I jump in with a question from the audience? Yeah. Oh, yes. Voted? It seems like I'm going to drop it in the chat and I'll also read it. Um, let's see, how do we address the elephant in the room when it comes to solving the climate crisis, economic growth? So much of the conversation around climate action still views growth as necessary and good, but to your point, we actually need degrowth. What does sustainable, equitable degrowth look like? Yes. Well, I don't know if, if you're a reader, but if you are, I highly recommend this 
great book called Donut Economics by Kate Rayworth. I, full disclosure, I actually signed up for an economics class first year of university and it was so boring that I fell asleep in it. And so I dropped it because I knew I wasn't gonna be able to pay attention. But if I love an economic book, I, I can assure you it is worth reading. And so in it, she basically explains that our entire economic system ignores everything that goes into it and everything that comes out of it. So we ignore all the resources that we dig out of the planet that are not finite, that are going into powering our economy. And we ignore all the waste that comes out the other end, which includes all of the air pollution that's responsible for an average of 9 million deaths per year around the world. We are ignoring everything that goes in and everything that comes out. And so advocates for a circular economy, which is really, I think, a kind of a nice uh, term because it has a very vivid mental image, is to say, hey, look, Whatever comes out and goes into our economy goes right back out the other side and it in turn goes right around back in the other side. So we have to stop thinking of the economy as something that floats around in outer space with infinite materials going in and infinite waste coming out. We have to think of it as part of a closed system. We live on a single planet that is a closed system and we have to start putting a value on the things that are going into our economy and the things that are coming out. How do we do that? Well, one example is by putting a price on carbon. It turns out that there are over 50 countries around the world that already have some type of price on carbon, including Canada, just across the border. And what that's doing is it's putting a cost on what's coming out of the economy. So it can be folded into our economic system. And in Canada, we're ratcheting up the price of, on carbon by $15 a year starting next year to really substantially advance to the point where producing carbon is gonna be more expensive than not producing carbon very quickly. So there's mechanisms that we can use within our economic system to help start the transition to a circular sustainable economy, which is what we must have because we live within a closed system. There's no debating the laws of physics. Thank you. <laughs> Kathy, you wanna ask another one? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> there's a there's a question in the the in the on the website about what is the single thing the Biden administration has done that you think will have the biggest impact and what didn't go far enough? Oh. Well, um, they haven't had a chance to do too much yet, <laughs> so it's still early days. But I have to say, as someone who works specifically at the local level, I work with cities, I work with transportation inf infrastructure engineers, I work with water managers. I'm a big fan of their focus on infrastructure. Because what we don't realize is all of our infrastructure that supports all of our lives, the built environment, our energy systems, our water systems, our internet systems, our transportation systems, all of those systems are built for conditions of the last century, not the next one. And so what that means is as climate change is loading the dice against us, these systems are failing. In fact, the, the US um, Association of Civil Engineers, they released a report card every couple of years and their latest report card gave most of the US infrastructure a failing grade just in terms of being able to cope with today's conditions, let alone the future. So it is really smart of the administration to recognize that if we don't shore up our infrastructure, we are going to be dealing with conditions that are much more typical of a low-income country in terms of not even having clean water come out of the tap, which some places in the US don't even have today, not having electricity, which some places in the US still don't have today, um, not being able to even drive or travel places because the infrastructure has broken down and does not exist. That's very smart, but we need to go further. And what we need is we really need something that addresses carbon across the whole economy, rather than trying to play the whack-a-mole game at the fair where you're like, okay, one plan for electricity generation, another plan for cars, another plan for trucks, another plan for airplanes. We need something that addresses the whole enchilada, so to speak. And that's where policies like carbon pricing and cap and trade come into play. They're well tested. They've been used in the US and around the world. Economists know how they work. We need something at the whole economy level to put a price on what is going into our economy and what is coming out of our economy, because only by doing that we'll be able to turn the corner. Wonderful. You have another one, Kathy? Are you yeah, ready? I just wonder, I wanted to ask you about your new position with the Nature Conservancy. What opportunities do you see there um, with respect to climate change and what sorts of arguments do you make for protection of wildlands mm -hmm. in that position? 
Absolutely. So again, um, climate change is a, a threat multiplier. In other words, you know, like I just said, we don't care about climate change because it's on our priority list. We care about because on our priority list is every reason to care about climate change. So on our priority list, we don't often think about it, but we humans have to breathe clean air. We need water to drink. We need food to eat. We need all the resources that this planet provides for us. And all of those depend on having functioning, healthy ecosystems, on having forests, on having animals and plants, on having clean oceans, on having all of the resources that this planet has supplied for us in such abundance over the history of human civilization, which are now being threatened by human expansion, by neglect, and by climate change. So with the Nature Conservancy, I'm really excited to join them. If, you're, if people are not familiar with them, they're um, the biggest conservation organization in the world. They have uh, properties in over 70 different countries. They work with governments and uh, with corporations, with um, all kinds of organizations around the world. And they understand that when it comes to conservation and biodiversity, climate change is the hole in the bucket. In other words, we're trying to, we're pouring all of our efforts, everything we have, our knowledge, our understanding, our resources, our time, our money into this bucket to try to maintain biodiversity, conservation, healthy ecosystems. But there's a hole in the bucket and the hole is getting bigger and bigger and the hole is climate change. If we don't fix climate change, we cannot fix hunger, poverty, lack of access to resources. We can't even fix gender equality, access to basic education. And we certainly won't be able to fix biodiversity loss and conservation issues. Climate change is the great threat multiplier. And so I'm really excited at working with TNC because they, they're an organization that builds bridges. They understand that everybody already cares even if they don't realize it. So our goal is to help people understand why they care because of the values they already have and how we can work together to help. Beautiful. Um, well, thank you, Catherine. We are just so appreciative that you would join us today in Montana virtually. Um, it's lovely to see you. And Kathy, um, thank you for joining us as a moderator. Um, and, and thank you to all the participants uh, um, for joining us today on your lunch hour um, and taking some time to think about how to communicate more effectively about climate. Um, like I said earlier, we were recording this event and we will share it um, as soon as possible with, um, I've been capturing rapid fire all these resources <laughs> and I think I've got them all, but hopefully um, we'll, we'll have a full list for you in the follow-up document. Um, and just for now, I just wanted to share quickly uh, for Families for a Livable Climate, um, Moms Clean Air Force Montana and Montana Mountain Mamas, just some resources quickly for you in the chat um, to check out um, activities that we're doing, upcoming events, uh, Families for a Livable Climate. We have a Families for Action group that meets every week and plans actions and um, engages with one-on-one -on -one conversations with other families about climate. Um, Moms Clean Air Force Montana meets monthly with moms to talk about climate and justice and Montana Mountain Mamas has all kinds of activities and a great dedication to public lands. Um, Kathy Whitlock also has a recent op-ed on wildlands and climate, and we will share that in the resources. Um, so thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.